Long before Canada and the world swooned over Justin Trudeau, there was the father, Pierre Elliott Trudeau. He blasted onto the national political stage in the mid-1960s, became prime minister in 68, and went on to become the third longest serving PM ever. Two new books recall the man and the time and offer remarkable context for today. And we are pleased to welcome their authors to our studio today. Paul Litt, professor of history, Carleton University, and the author of Trudomania, and Robert Wright, professor of history, Trent University's Durham campus, and the author of Trudomania, the rise to power of Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Thanks. First question is pretty obvious. You didn't rock, paper, scissors over who gets to call a book Trudomania, so you both decided to call it Trudomania? This is the uh, Pepsi challenge of Canadian history. <laughs> Except the, you can't do it blindfolded. This is the zeitgeist. The zeitgeist. Well, yeah. Okay. Um, Robert, admittedly a rather predictable question to start off with, but uh, seems like the right place to start. A lot of excitement a year ago over Justin Trudeau's election as prime minister. How reminiscent was that experience to what happened in 1968? Well, I think it was quite different. Uh, people have forgotten, I think, that Justin Trudeau, even three weeks before his electoral victory, was neck and neck with his contenders. That was never true for Pierre. Tr Pierre was always the front runner, and even his, uh, even his opponents said, this is a fait accompli, barring the unforeseen. So uh, tr Pierre Trudeau rode the crest of Trudeau mania into power. Justin was lagging in a third party, a third place party. Nothing was uh, foregone for him. That's a good point. When he won the leadership, he became prime minister right away. Yes, he did. Pierre Trudeau yeah, did. In April, that's okay. right. Okay, 1968 versus 2015 for you. Well, what Robert said is true, but I think they both benefited from a kind of pent-up desire for change. And uh, it was generational change, too. They were both seen as youthful, and the guys who were in were seen as, you know, passe. This generation, Robert, obviously knows Justin Trudeau, but they may not know anything about his dad, other than he had the same last name. Right. So tell us about the guy. What was he like? The guy, well, he was uh, born in 1919. Um, he was of uh, draft age in World War II, but didn't fight. He came out of a How Nash. Come? Well, he claimed it was because he was conditioned to think in the ways of French-Canadian nationalists. It wasn't their fight. So he came out of a nationalist milieu. He... Um, uh, lost his father at the age of 15, became a millionaire, got a very high-flying uh, Ivy League education, was multilingual, um, was, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, kind of introverted, very uh, self-confident, loved books, and uh, was, uh, was a leading Quebec intellectual at a time when Maurice Duplessis was premier and, uh, and in need of being challenged. So that, that's how I see him. And Paul, I gather, I mean, part of the reason Trudeau mania happened is because Pierre Trudeau was so different from everything that had come immediately before him. How so? He was this extraordinary amalgam of style and substance. Uh, people um, thought he was progressive because of signs like his lifestyle, where he was this bachelor playboy type. Um, on top of that, though, he um, had very firm opinions and uh, well-based um, opinions on Quebec and its place in Confederation. He was a uh, stalwart defender of federalism. So he had both things going for him. He looked like, you know, a man who um, could be an agent of change for Canada at the same time as he was preserving national unity. I do remember him saying, my last name may be Trudeau, but my mother's maiden name was Elliot, and I'm an Elliot too, and she was English. He did seem to encapsulate the sort of perfect coming together of English and French in one guy in some respects. Is that fair to say? It is fair to say, uh, although it, one, of the, one of the aspersions that stuck to him was that he didn't really belong anywhere, that he was both French-Canadian and uh, fluently uh, un-accented un, uh, English as well. And that, and that, that sort of uh, outsider status tended to stick with him. And I, I, think he, I think that does him a disservice. I think that idea that he was not really at home anywhere is, is one of those things that he worked really hard to overcome. What was the media's role in creating this whole image of super sexy Pierre Trudeau in 1968? Well, the media, particularly the uh, National Press Gallery, was more attuned to the concerns of the body politic than the average Canadian. So they functioned as kind of a distant early warning system. They knew about the Quebec problem. They were concerned about Americanization. They were generally very nationalistic and wanted Canada to update itself, to modernize. So when they um, were getting impatient with the 
Pearson regime and the old bickering between Pearson and Diefenbaker, they were kind of looking around for a man who would represent a new era for Canada. And Trudeau quickly emerged as that person um, through a combination of, as again I said earlier, um, style and substance. There was this incident in um, the House of Commons where he came in wearing an ascot and uh, wearing sandals for a vote, which in the outraged, House of Commons. outraged Stephen Baker, who thought it was a breach of decorum and an insult to the House. And that brought him to attention at a time when, you know, mod stylings were predominant in Canadian and North American culture. And people thought, hey, this is a guy who might be, you know, with it. And at the same time, in the same um, summer, he was developing a plan for, you know, constitutional renewal for Canada, one that would preserve federalism against claims for um, a special status for Quebec. There were some contradictions in Pierre Trudeau, and I want to pull a clip from your book, pull a clip. I want to pull an excerpt from your book mm -hmm. here. Sorry, let's talk literature, not television for a second. Here we go. Paul Litt writing in Trudeau Mania. Nevertheless, many inconsistencies coexisted at the heart of Trudeau mania. Trudeau, the anti-nationalist, became the darling of Canadian nationalists. Trudeau, the advocate of individual freedom, was raised to power by groupthink. Trudeau, the rational advocate of functional politics, rode an emotional wave of support into office. Trudeau, the devout liberal Democrat, generated a cult of personality, redolent of atavistic longings for a strong man. Okay, you've looked at it. How do you explain all these inconsistencies? Well, Canadian nationalism uh, latched onto him and made of him something that he wasn't necessarily himself. <laughs> uh, because he had all these admirable characteristics and he seemed to fit what was uh, required for the nation at the time, they projected a lot onto him, a lot of ambitions that they had for Canada. And uh, Trudeau himself, you know, was known, known to be an anti-nationalist. And uh, still, he couldn't do anything about it when Canadian nationalists picked him up as the, the agent of change who had modernized the nation. How do you help explain, though, that the guy who cared so much about individual rights and, and the state has no business in the bedrooms of the nation, the father of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, somehow over a period of a, you know, a night or two in Quebec ends up putting 500 people in jail without charges because of the October crisis? Explain that. Well, that's a tough one. I, I guess it's because um, Trudeau's conviction was that uh, the stability of the state overrode challenges. And um, that mingled with his deep aversion to Quebecois nationalism, uh, cinched it for him, clinched it for him. He, uh, he, simply, was, uh, he simply wasn't going to abide a violence, a violent response, a violent uh, sort of radical expression of, uh, of nationalism or separatism in Canada, and uh, of course that meant in Quebec. That was of course two years into his prime ministership, but in 1968, the year he got elected, which we have to add was a horrible year south of the border, right? This is yes. Bobby Kennedy assassinated, Martin Luther King assassinated, and here comes Trudeau. What were the big issues in 68 that, that helped usher him into power? In Canada? Yeah. To win well, that election. the case that I make is that there was only one issue, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't necessarily Trudeau, and it wasn't uh, anything that he sloganized, even including the uh, Just Society, which is the uh, phrase that he's most remembered for. Um, my sense of the period is that uh, Canadians were on edge, very anxious, because uh, the previous September uh, 1967. As Expo 67 faded into the rearview mirror, uh, René Lévesque uh, left the Liberal Party, formed what would become the PQ, gave uh, a kind of separatist urgency to everything that was happening, happening in Quebec. And uh, Canadians found themselves in the spring of 1968 in a full-blown national unity crisis. That's the case I make in the book. Do you agree that by 1968, it's a year after our centennial celebration where we're on top of the world and feeling fantastic about ourselves that, in some respects, Pierre Trudeau is English Canada's answer to tamping down Quebec nationalism? On, in a very broad sense, he is. Um, you know, some people um, know his policy and know it intimately and agree with it. Others just get an impression that he's going to solve the national unity crisis. Still others think, oh, this is great, he's going to put Quebec in its place. <laughs> so well, He always said... We, yes, I'm here to put Quebec in its place, and its no, place is within never, Canada. He, he, well, exactly. And um, I mean, the context in '68 is is one of um, it's very emotional, and there are these um, contrasting emotions of hope and fear. You know, hope that Canada can make something of itself and modernize and get through this period and find itself. Um, 
there's this idea that Canada is coming of age, and there's all this peaceable kingdom theory floating around, contradict, or contrasting Canada to the United States and all the problems it's having at the time with ghetto riots, Vietnam, and political assassinations. Yeah. So Canadians are very smug about you know, the, the opportunity that they have to become a better liberal democratic nation in North America. And at the same time, they're threatened internally by Quebec separatism. And so it's kind of this whipsaw of hope and fear that's working on people. And Trudeau embodies the solution. He embodies the solution. Let me follow up with you on that, Robert, because, I mean, we were all alive for 1967 for Centennial, and it was amazing. But I think anybody who's sort of under the age of 50 is not going to have any firsthand recollection of that. Has there been anything subsequent to 1967 in those intervening years that younger Canadians or newer Canadians could potentially relate to and say, ah... I guess it was something like that, eh? I can't I, I think of anything. I can't either. Um, in fact, my only recollections of, of analogies date from the same period, the, hmm. the, the Canada-Russia series. Uh, At 72. Uh, thinking thinking uh, rather backhandedly about responses when nationalism was threatened. The free trade debate of 1988 comes to mind. Hmm. Um, and 9-11, of course, the... the, the the th the existential threat to any Western democracy. Yeah. But there's nothing really, in my opinion, like 1968. Those international hockey victories are interesting, though, because um, nationalism, nationalism is gratified not just by internal unity, but by external recognition. Hmm. So things like um, those hockey victories bring Canada international claim. It's the best at this sport in the world. And it's, you know, part of Canadian identity to play hockey. It's the same thing with Expo 67. Expo 67 won international acclaim. Canadians were really chuffed at the status they were getting internationally from it. And Trudeau was like that. Other nations were saying, look at that trendy leader. Have you heard that lately? And uh, <laughs> you know, Canadians were really, uh, really proud to have somebody who gave them international status. It's interesting. Pierre Trudeau and Justin Trudeau would be probably the only two Canadian leaders of the last 75 years that anybody outside of Canada would know. That's probably fair to say, isn't it? And the only two who can go shirtless and get away with it. <laughs> well, that's another issue. <laughs> but let's, on this anniversary, on this first anniversary anyway, of the current Prime Minister's uh, victory, let's look back at uh, the similarities between father and son. Were there any? Oh, sure. Um, uh, if, you if you look beneath the uh, very, admittedly, very attractive surface of Justin Trudeau, you've got uh, Pierre's son. Uh, when asked to, uh, to state his uh, his basic political principles in 25 words or less, it's vintage Trudeau. The, the nation should never be the basis of the state and uh, collective rights should never trump the rights of the individual. He's also said we're the children of the charter, which is uh, interesting. Mm. I'm, the child, I'm the child of Pierre, but we're all children of the charter. So at a, I think at a deep level, um, and we'll see more of this now that he's heading into his second year and having to make some tough decisions. and and starting to uh, alienate some of the own uh, constituencies that he brought together in that coalition, I think we're going to see him emerge more like Pierre. How would father and son be different in your eyes? Well, Trudeau is known to be aloof. Which one? Pierre. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Justin's very touchy-feely, I think. But it's interesting when you think about it, and look back to that boxing match, think of all the training he did to this pull that off. Match. The son. And you know the effortless mastery that came through uh, training, and he did the same for the debates in the 2015 election campaign. And very much like his father in that way. Hmm. It might look easy, but there's a lot of work and discipline that goes into it. But just to follow up on what you said, the touchy-feely, like deep personal connection that he is able, the son, mm -hmm. to have with people, that's more his mother than his father, right? Could be. Uh, we haven't seen as much of his mother in the media, so we, I, don't, I wouldn't be able to judge that. Um, the, the interesting thing about the attraction of the father, though, was that that aloofness left people wanting more. Hmm. And uh, so even though he was aloof and uh, some people would condemn him as arrogant, uh, it was still alluring in a way. Gotcha. Okay. I could, uh, there I go again. An excerpt from your book, if we may. Canadian Conservatives disparaged Trudeau, circa 1968, as the worst sort of socialist, the kind who imposed his collectivist fantasies on his own people by stealth. Canadian left nationalists dismissed Trudeau as a laissez-faire liberal who did nothing to counter the rapacious American takeover of Canada. Quebec nationalists hold Trudeau almost single-handedly responsible for la fin d'un rêve canadien, the end of a Canadian dream. It is not unusual to read in even the most erudite Trudeau scholarship 
the aspersion that Pierre Trudeau felt no genuine sense of belonging to either Quebec or Canada and was thus all the more dangerous for having been a perennial outsider. We have to tackle this here. Robert, he's been dead 16 years. Yes. Pierre Trudeau. Yes. He's been out of office for 32. There's still a lot of hatred in the land for this there guy. Is. Why is that? I'd like to know. Um, uh, actually, the, uh, the, the genesis of my book was to try to come to grips with that. Um, there are uh, books and articles and uh, garden variety political rants on offer even now which uh, treat him as if he's still alive and as if he's still articulating that vision of Canada that we know so well as his. Uh, so I think if, uh, if it boils down to one thing, it's the persistence of, of an idea of Canada. And um, it was uniquely his, and he defended it in power and out. He took it to the debate over uh, Meech Lake and Charlottetown. He was persistent with it. And I think that's the answer. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I think uh, most of the prime ministers who followed uh, fall into the category of good managers. But he was, he was truly visionary, and people are still taking him on. That vision is still uh, a target, and mm. uh, I, I think that's what it is. You know, as much as many people in Ontario and Quebec loved Pierre Trudeau, I think there was a time in this country, maybe for about 30 years, where between Thunder Bay and British Columbia, the Liberal Party federally had two seats. Mm -hmm. And that was it, because Pierre Trudeau basically destroyed the Liberal Party in Western Canada for, for a couple of generations. Some of that still exists out there, doesn't it? Do you know why there's so much antipathy to Trudeau the father still in some pockets of this country? Part of it, I think, is the um, belief that Central Canada is obsessed about national unity at the expense of the other regions, mm -hmm. and uh, that they always get left out. But there's also this... When I'm looking at 1968, I, I see a, a real split there, a victory for the forces of modernity or for modernizing Canadians against traditional and conservative Canadians. And although the cities voted for Trudeau in the West in 1968, the rural areas did not. And uh, subsequently, you see the cities becoming more like the rural areas in terms of their political alignments mm -hmm. and uh, resenting the centre. And by that, they mean you know, the modern Canada that Trudeau is associated with. Let's finish up on this. You're, you're both, I think, probably too young to really have any first-hand memories of Trudeau mania in 1968, aren't you? Yes. Let's fess up. You both are, aren't you? Oh, way too young. <laughs> way too young. <laughs> so let's talk about, through the course of your research, whether or not you see any lasting effects of Trudeau mania from back then to today. Robert. Lasting effects. Uh, not particularly. I think the Canadian... Um, I, th I think Canada's a very difficult place to govern. I think it's possible that uh, Pierre Trudeau, in the period 1965 to 1968, when he, when he ceased to be a philosopher king and became a working politician... He was justice minister. Yes, he was. But I think he might have underestimated that. That's not something I think that Justin has done. Um, and I think it's the... Uh, I think it's the... I think this is a tough place to govern. And I think um, if there's a... If there's an in, if there's something enduring about Trudeau mania, if the, the, to go back to your earlier point, why it hasn't reproduced itself, why it's not, why we don't see much evidence of that kind of thing, it's because uh, this is a place that calls out for good management. Um, and that's the kind of leadership we've had since Trudeau mania in a way. Can't remember who said it, but Canada's got too much geography and not enough history was, I think, the, uh, the claim, which yep. makes it so hard yep. to govern. Paul, your final comments on this? Lasting effects of Trudeau mania? Well, certainly his plan for national unity won out. It was a close-run thing, but it, in the, at the moment it seems to have prevailed. Who knows about the future? But the way I look at it is that there's still a myth of Canadian identity that was formulated in the 60s and cemented through Trudeau mania, with him being the nationalist man uh, in, put into power. And that that is um, continued. That, that myth prevails in the face of many uh, realities on the ground that contradict the myth. There's never been a similar conjunction of, you know, the feisty spirit of the 60s and Canadian nationalism finding um, realization through, uh, you know, first of all, those national celebrations of the centennial and Expo 67 and Trudeau mania. Um, you know, the neoliberal uh, counter-revolution has been aspiring to change Canada for decades since, but it's never had the ability to um, you know, formulate an identity of Canada that has endured as long. 
Gentlemen, thank you for coming in and talking about Trudeau Mania, the original. Not the 2.0 version, but the original from 1968. Paul Litt, Carleton University. Robert Wright, Trent University. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.